All right, one of the interesting things about looking at shear in beams is that in, when you want that shear stress distribution on the cross section and if that's vertically oriented, you go to the 90 degree or the horizontal plane in order to develop that model. Right, so let's take a, a slightly closer look at that from a physical standpoint. Right, now let's go back basic Bernoulli Euler, Euler beam theory from which we developed the whole segment equals my over i model to begin with. One of the crucial critical aspects of that model was plane sections remain plane. And we're going to continue to use this normal stress model to get us to the horizontal shear stress and then to the shear stress on the uh, cross section. Right, so let's go back then to our basic beam, right? The little sponge beam that has all these little red lines that represent the edge of the cross sectional plane. Right, put this down a little bit lower here. And we bend it, and those red lines under small deformation theory will remain then straight. If we crank it over, then they are no longer quite straight. There's some warping of the cross section that's going to happen. Right, so again, this basic small deflection theory and red, the red lines remain straight. And that's that whole notion of plane sections remain plane. Right, now, if we go and look at not a solid beam, but rather a beam made up of a whole bunch of thin plies, in this case, that would be five of these plies here, and we'll line them all up. This is just an aluminum yardstick, okay? And so if you look at the edge, that is fairly nice and straight on the edge. And then when we get uh, ready to bend them, notice what's gonna happen to that straight edge. We bend it, and all of a sudden, we see that we have what well, kind of looks like a parallelogram there in the end. Instead of being nice and 90 degrees, oh, those five plies, those lamin laminations, so to speak, slide past each other. And that's because there's no horizontal shear transfer. Those plies are not bonded together. And the small amount of friction that's available there, which is almost nothing, it doesn't prevent that those plies from sliding back and forth. Kind of an interesting thing when we go back to sigma equals my over i the plane sections remain plane business what we could have also said here is that there's no shearing deformations which is kind of a strange thing no shearing deformations that would be those plies going back and forth taking that rectangle and skewing it one way or the other right that that's a shearing type deformation and we're going to ignore that Again, that's kind of weird, but note, if it's fully bonded in that bending deformation, then those horizontal layers don't slide past each other, no shearing deformations of any particular significance. Right? Things have to be locked in to prevent that from happening. So when we go and we're taking a look then at this little DX of the beam coming down here, and then looking at these normal stresses that are on either side of that, we're going to be focusing on all the things that were associated with this model. And we're going to use that, then pull out, and here's the physical beam, right, the bigger sponge beam, right, under bending. We're going to pull out this little top piece here, and that's the one we're going to be looking at. Now, we're going to pretend that this distance right here is dx, a differential distance, but of course it's a big, gigantic delta difference to, to us and you're going to see that little b that's going to show up and that's here that's the width of the beam this way we're bending in this plane in this direction and b is in the other direction right so in a sense it kind of bends that way so we have dx this way and b in the other and that's this little piece this little wedge that we've got here pull it out as completely as a free body diagram so we've got some horizontal resultant, that's the shear force on this horizontal plane right here. We have a net resultant of the stresses over this little left plane that's on this side. Same thing over on this side. And if you come and look, you have this little stress prism and that the edge of which we see here, that's the normal stress on the right coming from the sigma equals my over i. It's variable in a linear fashion away from the the neutral axis. And we'll just integrate that tiny little sigma over that dA over that whole thing. In other words, we're actually finding the volume of the stress prism is what this integral actually represents. 
there's just a simple equilibrium between those two and whatever's left over. That's got to be then the horizontal uh, shear force that then we'll assume is averaged out on the bottom of this surface. And that will give us then a shear stress on a horizontal plane. And then because of the equilibrium of the little tiny stress block, then that will also be the stress on the vertical plane. That's the linkage between all these. But it's kind of interesting that it starts with plane sections remain plane and assuming no shear deformation, which actually though does end up meaning that we do have a shear stress. So we've already actually forecast what would happen in an advanced uh, course of mechanics and materials and a more advanced model, more, slightly more accurate model, which would permit these sections to not remain plane would include shear deformations in the overall uh, scheme of things. But the mo this model actually works for most civil engineering beings quite well, so that we don't necessarily need that advanced model. Okay, so and then um, we will shortly go into more detail about what's happening with all this.